Holy Spirit. You look directly inside us. Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning that you are a good shepherd who sees, who hears, who knows our hearts. Lord, you know our fears, you know our anxieties, you know our concerns and the cares that are weighing on us. You know our burdens, Lord, and you ask us to come to you. And so, Lord, that's what we do in this moment before we begin teaching and small group discussion. We just come to you and say, Lord, we want to give you our burden. And uh, we ask you to be with us now. We ask you to just enter in that your Holy Spirit would reign over this teaching time, uh, reign over my words, reign over our minds and the attitudes of our hearts. Lord, may this teaching time, may you use it to shepherd our minds and shepherd our hearts, transform them to be more like yours, Lord to be more like you. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. All right, ladies. Well, welcome to Bible study. It's, it's wonderful to be with you this morning. Uh, today, I have a story to share. And I've shared this story many, many years ago. It's actually from a book by, it, this is a business book, so I'm sure not many of us have this in, in our libraries, but this is a book by Dennis Waitley called The Empires of the Mind, and in it he shares this story. It's a true story about a man named Nick. Nick was a strong, healthy railroad yardman who got along with his fellow workers and was consistently reliable on the job. However, he was a deep, pessimist. He invariably feared the worst. One summer day, the train crews were told that they could quit an hour early in honor of the foreman's birthday. And when the other workmen had left the site, Nick, who's this notorious worrier, was accidentally locked in an isolated refrigerated box car that was in the yard for repairs. He panicked. He shouted, he banged until his voice went hoarse and his fists were bloody. And the noises, if anyone heard them, were assumed to be coming from a nearby playground or from the other trains backing in and out of the yard. And Nick reckoned that the temperature in the car was zero degrees. And he thought, if I can't get out, I'll freeze to death. So he found a cardboard box and shivering uncontrollably, he scrawled a message to his wife and his family. So cold, bodies getting numb. If I could just go to sleep, these may be my last words. Well, the next morning, the crew slid open the boxcar's heavy doors and they did find Nick's body. An autopsy revealed that every physical sign indicated that Nick had frozen to death. But, ladies, the car's refrigeration unit was inoperative. It was broken. The temperature inside this uh, car was 61 degrees, and there was plenty of fresh air. Nick's fear had become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh my goodness. I mean, the power of the mind, the power of the mind, bad thinking leads to bad living. Good thinking leads to good living. And so maybe it's not, you know, I get where the saying you are what you eat comes from, but maybe it's not necessarily you are what you eat, but it's you are what you think. You are what you think. The mind, the mind is that part of us responsible for our thoughts and our feelings, especially our capacity to reason. And the apostles understood the power of the mind. Paul urged the Philippians in Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So here in 1 Peter chapter 4, I think Peter gives his 
take on the things we should think about and how we should think. Starting with verse one, this was day one, verse one, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with Christ-like thinking. And Peter utilizes a great word picture for how we ought to think in the midst of trials and suffering. This word picture, it circles all the way back to the beginning of Peter's letter. We saw this in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, when he said, therefore prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. And we discussed back then in chapter one that this Greek word prepare points to this ancient custom for gathering up one's long robes and tying them around the waist for action, for strenuous activity, for uh, fast walking or running. So to have, he's saying to have Christ's same way of thinking is strenuous work. It is hard work. Why? Because Christ, Christ didn't take on this. He didn't take on flesh for fun. He didn't take on flesh to follow human passions or just see what it feels like to wear a human body. No, Christ took on flesh for the purpose of suffering, for the purpose of suffering. And so that's why Peter says here, look, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with his way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. That's our call, friends. It, so, I mean, that's the call right here in the beginning of chapter four, to have the mind of Christ, to follow him, and do the will of God. And we follow him when we cease to sin. And uh, yeah, okay, we're, we're going to dig into that. Christ-like thinking leads to Christ-like living. And Peter knows that having the mind of Christ is hard. Remember, Peter himself had trouble thinking like Christ, so much so that Christ figuratively speaking, smacked Peter upside the head saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your what? You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I just say, yikes, yikes. If Peter, the rock of Christ's church, struggled to have Christ's way of thinking, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for us? Uh, ultimately, perhaps it can bring us hope, right? Perhaps this can bring us hope. But how many of us would agree, I need help with Christ-like thinking? I know I do. And if you want to use the chat box to say, me too, Carmen, you'll make me feel better. Um, if, if, if Nick is a zero in good thinking and Christ is a 10 in good thinking, where am I? Where are you on the good thinking scale between zero and 10? You know, just jot it down in private for yourself. Nobody's going to see that. But I think it might be good to think about today. That way, maybe six months from now, we, we, can, we can come back to this and say, hey, am I thinking more like Christ today? Good thinking leads to good living, worthy thinking. I, I had a hard time choosing which word to use. I thought of all of these. Worthy thinking leads to worthy living. Excellent thinking lives to excellent living. Christ-like thinking leads to Christ-like living. So how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we think with the mind of Christ. Well, Peter has some very, very, very clear instructions for us. Did you notice all the imperative verbs in this chapter? 
Okay, there are tons. Now, nine of them are what are true imperative verbs in the original Greek, uh, but there are many others that become imperatives as they are translated from the Greek into English. So there's tons here. I'm going to take a look at these nine original ones to the Greek. And here's what I'd like us to do as we take a peek. I'd like you to note, okay, which one or which ones are speaking to my heart today? Uh, note which ones speak to your own fears, your own anxieties, which ones speak to you as far as having the mind of Christ. What I'd like to do today is make Peter's instructions like super practical, ultra practical for the transformation of our hearts and our minds to be more like his. So day one, we've already talked about this first imperative verb. Uh, Peter says, arm yourselves, prepare your mind. Christ, Christ said to Peter, set your mind, be resolved to have the mind, the attitude of Christ. And in essence, Peter is, is saying, look, suffering in this flesh is a battle. It's a battle to wear this. Um, so prepare for action, like gird up the mind. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 6, 13. He said, therefore, what? Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand firm. So uh, we observe this first imperative. We've better understood. We've interpreted what it means. Now, what does it look like to apply it? We're going to do a lot of application today practical application. And here, I think bottom line is no Christ, right? No Christ. Chapter one, Peter calls it being born again. In chapter two, he calls it belief, believing in Christ. And, and you might remember he referred to Jesus as being this cornerstone. And he said the honor is for those who, what, who believe, who, who believe in this cornerstone. So off the bat this morning, I just, I kind of want to interject or clarify a little confusion from last week's study arising from the end of chapter three, when Peter makes the statement in verse 18, baptism now saves you. Do you remember that? A little confusing. Friends, Pulling out that one verse is misleading. Do you remember our rules for studying New Testament letters? Um, number one, remember the first century context. Number two, understand their problem. Number three, what we think in paragraphs. We want to understand what is the main point of the paragraph. So that's important here. Baptism is not what saves. When we look at Peter's letter as a whole, Peter is saying belief in Jesus saves. But baptism is a picture of his salvation. It's, 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 this, it's this beautiful picture. It's something we do to publicly proclaim and celebrate our belief that in Christ, we have died to self and we have been raised again to life, to a new life in Jesus. So practical application is knowing Jesus is, is, you know, taking a look, do I believe in him? And John, I love the way that John says it. John 1 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Salvation being born again really is that simple. It's that simple. Believe, receive, and believe Jesus. So if anybody is still asking, but Carmen, what if I haven't been baptized? Friend, if you have believed and received Jesus, you are saved. But I might ask you, what are you waiting for? Baptism is just, it's a beautiful, beautiful celebration and a beautiful way to proclaim your faith. Uh, we can help you with that if you're interested. And then if there's anyone asking, well, Carmen, I'm not even sure I really have put my trust that I've really believed or received Jesus. What do I do? Well, friend, you can know for sure in this very moment, in this very moment, it's a simple prayer. It's as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, I 
believe. I believe in you. And I receive you as Lord and Savior uh, of my life. All right? It's that simple. For all of us who have believed, who know Jesus, we can know, we can be assured. Pastor Mike's been telling us this. We can be assured that we are armed with the Holy Spirit and we are armed with living hope. We are armed with what we need to think like Christ. And for this, we praise him. And we talked about praise back in chapter one. And this is another practical application for this imperative. Friends, praise solidifies the hope that we have in our hearts. Praise arms us and prepares us for the fiery trials. Um, wow. I, I mean, I have to share my heart has been heavy. I mean, my heart has been heavy for months. My heart has been especially heavy this week for dear ones who are suffering and walking through deep, deep, deep waters, COVID, cancer, divorce, depression, death, um, the, tr the suffering and trials. And maybe I, I, I just sense that a lot of you are feeling this too. Doesn't it feel like the suffering and trials seem to keep rolling in like waves incessantly? It's like boom, boom, boom. And just this week, as I was preparing to talk about suffering with this mind of Christ, uh, my next door neighbor died and he leaves behind a wife of many, many years. She's devastated. And on Monday night, uh, a young man, a former soccer buddy of my son, he died. He's in his twenties after battling bone cancer. He leaves behind a very young wife and she's devastated. So I don't, I don't sit here in my comfy home and say flippantly, look, praise God in the midst of suffering. If you follow steps A, B, and C, you'll be fine. Pain is real. Grief is real. Suffering is real. And one of my most favorite verses in all of scripture is John 1135. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Praise. What praise does is it helps us remember the reality of Jesus Christ, that he took on flesh and blood. He took this on to suffer for us. Uh, not to condemn our weaknesses. He didn't complain in his suffering. He didn't ever say, what's wrong with you? He didn't grumble as he served us. He simply died to self. He, he gently and humbly entered into our suffering, into our pain, into our brokenness. He suffers with us, friends. He loves us. He weeps with us. Uh, he showers us with his compassion. He reminds us of our living hope as he brings us to God. Praise helps us remember all of those things. Praise helps us lean into him. Praise reminds us that his strength will carry us through these fiery and refining trials. Praise leads to good thinking and good thinking leads to good living. So this one, this imperative, this is the primo imperative, I think, of chapter four. All the other imperatives that we see in this chapter tie into this first one. Arm yourselves with Christ's way of thinking. Now, in day two, we find two more. Verse seven, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. That's an interesting addition there. But the imperatives are uh, be self-controlled and sober-minded. We are to be armed in this way. Our thinking is to be armed with self-control and sober-mindedness. 
Self-control means to be sensible, reasonable. Sober-minded means to not be under the influence of anything else. And we might ask, well, what are the influences? I mean, sure, the obvious is wine or alcohol, but friends, influencers can be family, friends, the world, peer pressure, our own selfish desires. Influencers can be the news, social media. Influencers can be fear and anxiety. So the practical application here, I think, is we need to confront the influencers. Influencers say, think this way. But instead, Peter's saying, no, don't listen to them. Think this way. Be sensible. Be reasonable. Think on those things that are true. And Nick is an example for us here. He lost all sense of control. He lost all sober-mindedness, and he let his thoughts go wild. If we're honest, friends, we've all done this to varying degrees. Let our thoughts go wild. I mean, several times I've shared the story with you of having four little ones when Dave left for a business trip to Israel. He was on the airplane when the U.S. government announced a warning against U.S. citizens being in Israel, being in the Middle East. And friends, my thoughts went wild. How quickly, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say how quickly I imagined him kidnapped or bombed or tortured and how quickly in my mind I became Became a widow with four little ones to feed. I mean, thank goodness for a brave friend who kind of, she smacked me upside the head figuratively speaking, saying, Carmen, you're not thinking on things that are true. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of a very polarized election, and in the midst of all kinds of bad news, we must be sensible. We must be reasonable. We must remember our living hope and that ultimately Christ reigns. Paul says we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5. So friends, practically, if need be, turn off the influencers, replace the voices of the influencers with God's word, study. I'm so thankful you're here studying, study, memorize, make post-it notes and reminders of his promises. My, um, my son called as soon as as he learned of his friends Hans's death on Monday evening. They played college soccer together. They pulled pranks together. They talked about Jesus together. My son, being a pastor, married him uh, when his cancer was in remission. He baptized him this spring as they together prayed for a miracle. And Monday night, in his grief and his sadness, he said this to me, he said, mom, the reality is, the reality is that right now, Hans is with Jesus. No more pain. He said, I know and believe that. Friends, that's living hope. That's, um, that's self-control. That's sober-minded. That's sensible, reasonable thinking in the midst of of fiery troubles, in the midst of real suffering, in the midst of death. All right, today three, we have two more imperatives here, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice, rejoice in this in so far as you share in Christ's suffering. So do not be re re surprised and rejoice. Now, I think the meaning is pretty clear. We don't have to go in too deep here. It's pretty straightforward. Don't be surprised and rejoice. Be glad. And although it, this is not really funny, I did laugh out loud. And I mean, that was a with a grimace kind of laugh out loud. And I ask God, I'm like, oh, Lord, why am I always surprised by trials? And Lord, I rarely count it all joy. I rarely rejoice at them. 
Friends, Peter did. Peter learned to practice this. In Acts 5, Luke records that he and other apostles were arrested and beaten for proclaiming the name of Jesus. When they were let go, they did what? They rejoiced. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer in the flesh for the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter, Peter's basically saying, look, Christ suffered in the flesh. We're going to suffer in the flesh. Don't be surprised. Rejoice. Be glad. Be glad for the opportunity we have to live in this flesh to bring glory to Jesus. Like praise, rejoicing, giving thanks. This arms our minds for suffering. Uh, years ago in a sermon, I know I've shared this before, pastor challenged us to list 10 things we were thankful for. And honestly, that morning after getting the family to church, I sat there in the pew and I struggled. And I was super convicted. Practicing praise, practicing thanks. Uh, this helps arm our minds. It helps prepare our minds to be like Christ. And then ladies here, I'm just going to toss out this other practic practical tidbit. For me, this was personal and I, uh, but for some reason, I feel like I'm supposed to share this and be vulnerable with you that maybe this is helpful for somebody else. But here's another practical way that came out for me for rejoicing. A simple smile, a simple smile. I mean, friends, today we live in a multitude of emojis. There's an emoji to express every mood, isn't there? Back when I was a girl, guess what? We had one emoji, the smiley face. A smile, a smile is a natural way of rejoicing, of expressing joy. And no matter where we travel in the world, smiles have no language barriers. I have been blessed so many times by the smiles of others. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a glad heart makes a cheerful face, the sorrow of the heart, the spirit, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is crushed. So I toss it out there, consider it, think about it. Could a smile be a simple way we have to rejoice, to thank God uh, for the flesh that we have, even though we have suffering and pain and trials? Think about it. All right. Last day, day four, there were four imperatives here. Uh, we have suffer. We have uh, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, as a meddler. That was number one. We had let him not be ashamed. That was number two. But uh, let him glorify. That was number three. Let him glorify God in that name, in the name of Christian, in the name of Jesus. And glorify means to esteem. It means to worship, means to adore. If we could travel back to first, the first century, we would see what the Romans adored and what the Romans glorified. They glorified the emperor. They worshiped him. They glorified the theater with its risque performances. They glorified the chariot races and the gladiator fights with their blood and gore. By abstaining from these popular events, and I'm just going to say, quote, pleasures, because the Romans thought of them as pleasures, like sex outside of marriage, drinking, slander, lying, covetousness, uh, Christians earned the reputation of being killjoys. Uh, Romans looked at them as if their lives were devoid of any pleasure. Converts to Christianity often had to choose between Christ or their BC friends, their before Christ friends. Friends, is their problem our problem? Sound familiar? I mean, I, I think, wow, nothing's really changed, has it? Nothing has really changed when it comes to what we glor what the world glorifies and how we might be as Christians looked upon when we glorify Christ alone. 
So practically speaking, the practical application, I think this is hard, friends. Um, when I think of abstaining from things of the world, I'm reminded of this little statue that sat on my grandma's coffee table. And maybe you've seen one like this. Three monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And honestly, as a little girl, these three monkeys scared me. They looked miserable. <laughs> they just, yeah, they had horrible faces. Uh, rather than put the focus on what not to do, rather than put the focus on abstaining from things, what if we simply put our focus on what we're called to do? And that is glorify God. Practically speaking, we do this when we serve him, when we serve others. Uh, this is a practical way to have the mind of Christ. We glorify him when we love one another earnestly. We glorify him when we practice hospitality without grumbling. These are the ways we glorify him. And when we're serving in this way, when we're busy serving him, we really don't have time to think about these other things uh, that we are uh, called to abstain from. Let's let the focus be glorifying Christ and we're going to be okay. Finally, the very last imperative verb is in verse 19. And many of you chose this as your favorite verse. Uh, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Entrust, to put our cares into God's hands. That's simply what it means, to put our cares into his hands, to, to, to yield our burdens to him. And practically for me, ladies, this just means enjoying a few minutes of regular quiet when I had little ones, I got up early. I still get up early. This is often a prayer walk. Quiet. Quiet is where we soak in God's presence. It's where we exchange our fears for his living hope. This is Christ's way of thinking too. This was how, I mean, think of him going to the mountain to pray, to entrust himself to the one who judges justly, as, as Peter said back in chapter two. Friends, I know that was a lot. That was a lot of practical application, but I hope maybe there were one or two imperative verbs, one or two practical applications that resonated with your heart, with your own fears and needs. Suffering, it's real. It's a part of wearing this flesh. It's painful. It's heart-wrenching. And I think our instinct, I know our instinct is to be like Nick. In fear, we kick, we scream, we bang our hands and our head against things. Friends, Christ understands. He enters into our suffering with us. He did something so radically different. He died to self. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. We're called to have a mind like his. Um, may God help us work through our own fears, our own anxieties, our own kicking and screaming. May he quiet us with the mind of Christ because good thinking leads to good living. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. You are such a sweet, gentle, kind, and humble shepherd. You see us, you know us, you know our fears, you know our burdens, you know, uh, yeah, you just know us and you see us right where we are and you enter in with us. You are with us now. Um, thank you, Lord. I pray for each of us as we listen to your words, as we unpack First uh, Peter chapter 4, if you would just help it to soak in, Lord. Help us to yield to you. Help us to have the mind of Christ, to be armed in these ways, Lord, to be more like you, to think more like you, and to live more like you. We love you so much, Jesus, and are so grateful that you are with us. Thank you. Amen.